Before we begin today's service, I'd like to say just two things. First, I want to let everyone here know that as we complete and finalize the construction of Gallagher Iva Arena, that those that we remember today will be honored in a very significant manner in perpetuity with this facility. The second thing I would like to say, I would like to say thank you to our Big 12 Conference brothers and sisters. Words can ex express our thanks to you. So prior to starting, however, I would like for us to take a moment or two of reflection. Thank you. I will now turn our service over to Mr. Kelly Ogle, anchor of Channel 9, good friend of Bill Teagan's 1985 graduate, Oklahoma State University. Kelly. Please be seated, everyone. I know you all feel like I do. It is good to be with our OSU family today, isn't it? We have really been through some tough days, and uh, we have some tough days ahead of us. And uh, the last few days, I kind of feel like I've been walking around in a fog. I prayed Sunday night to God that he would give me the ability to look past the pain and the loss and begin to really remember the positive and uh, good memories I have and uh, God has been faithful just as he always is. He is a God of love and peace and comfort and mercy and all we have to do is ask and my prayer today is that he would bring that into this arena and um, we're here to remember ten great guys today you know and to say thank you to God that he allowed their lives to intersect with ours, and what a blessing they all were. You know, one of God's great gifts to us is music, and it has a tremendous healing power. And I'd like you to join me as we listen to the OSU Cowboy Chorale under the direction of Dr. Robert Ward. Dr. Ward?
Thank you, Dr. Ward and Corral. It was beautiful. Um, OSU Vice President Dr. Harry Birdwell is going to come now and lead us in a time of prayer and a message of hope. Please bow with me. Like the psalmist of old, we pray, hear our cries, O God. From the depth of our souls, we cry, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou art a refuge for me, my tower of strength against all enemies. Let me dwell in your house forever. Let me take refuge under the shade of thy wings. God, we come here today with hearts broken. We've shared in a common tragedy that has left us with more questions than answers. We've come to mourn the loss of family and friends. We come here to comfort and to be comforted. May these families, this team and this university family be comforted in the knowledge that we are enveloped in love and upheld by your gracious and omnipotent hand. God, we pray especially for the families whose dreams have been shattered, for parents who have lost sons, for wives who have lost husbands, and for children who have lost fathers. We pray for opportunities today and in the days to follow, opportunities to touch them as instruments of your love and peace. Help us all in our search to restore our strength and heal our spirits. And amen. Last Saturday night at 9.30, Eddie Sutton left a simple message with my son. Find your father. We need him. Little did Coach Sutton know how prophetic those words were for all the days since and for those that will follow. Within minutes, I pulled into the parking lot beside Coach Sutton. On the way up the sidewalk, he spoke only two or three sentences about his deepest fears. And then we opened the office door into the basketball office suite where the team and the staff waited. There they were, the faces you all recognize, those guys that can jump to the rafters and tear down backboards. Somehow this night was different. There were only looks of terror and looks of hope against hope that the rumors couldn't possibly be true. Tonight, they weren't bigger than life. Tonight, they were vulnerable young men, learning life's most difficult lesson at far too young an age. Immediately, work began to try to verify information, developing an accurate passenger list, and to begin to consider the unthinkable. The next 30 to 45 minutes dragged on forever, and finally the certainty of the accident was established. The unmanageable had happened. The same athletic program that has brought this university so many opportunities for common pride had now been visited by one of its greatest tragedies. As we sat with Coach Sutton and his families, were given that unimaginable, horrible news. I looked in his eyes and I knew how true his words were. I need you. The shoe was on the other foot. We all have always considered Coach the father figure for our basketball team. But he lost sons. And now he needed us. His staff needs us. Those looks of terror turned into looks of disbelief and then grief. Those few outsiders of us who were witness to that evening saw something almost 
sacred. Our basketball team was welded and bonded together emotionally as perhaps none has ever been at OSU. And whether or not they say it in words, they really do need us now. Pray for them, uphold them, and when they play again, support them as never before. Not because they're our team, but because they are young men who need to live beyond this devastating moment. Outside those offices that night, among 10 families extended across several states, incomprehensible anguish set in. And it's so self-evident how much those families and the relatives of those who were lost need us. And if the families haven't said so, they do need us. Since none of us can adequately answer the question why, I trust that you have already begun to ask instead, how should I respond to support those whose lives have been turned upside down? Out of their grief, many in this university family have already found creative ways to express their care and concern. I have always believed that the greatness of a university should be judged in part in how it cares about people. That's what I treasure most about OSU. And in this instance, this university gets an A+. I hope you all leave here today committed to the notion that through our common commitment, Generations even yet unborn will remember these wonderful ten who touched us all. They represented extraordinary gifts. I hope none of you will grieve passively and do nothing tangible to support these families and to preserve their memory. And so continue to pray for these families and for this team. Wear your orange ribbon to all the rest of our basketball games. Write a note on the card provided to you as you entered the arena. They will be shared with the families. To honor these wonderful men, volunteer your time at their favorite charities. Give to one of the funds established to support families with young children. Contribute to scholarship funds that have been set up to honor these friends. Permit your grief to find expression in helping the university to appropriately honor them. Use your grief as a call to action. In times like these, Coach Sutton's words instruct all of us in an even deeper sense. Find your father. We need him. Our finite strength and intelligence is inadequate, and it fails us when circumstances overwhelm us. Oklahomans know better than most at the times of our greatest need, God is faithful to his promises. Scripture says God is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from evil. Experience should have taught us all that leaning on the arms that are stronger than our own is the only way to cope with tragedy. During these past 90 hours, I have found great comfort in the simple lines of an old hymn that I learned very early as a child. I've muttered them under my breath today a hundred times. He silently guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. God has used the goodness of others to bring great comfort to this university family. 
He has used the acts of thousands as songs in our night to comfort these grieving families and players and to begin to raise a university community that has been driven off its feet. The first song in the night was literally that. It came only moments after the confirmation announcement last Saturday night. Eskimo Joe's, a place not normally known for its selection of religious music, experienced a moment of spontaneous silent prayer. And then the band began to play the strains of Amazing Grace. The songs in our night that have come to these families and this university can only be viewed as the extension of God's hands and love. Prayers from throughout the world, hugs, encouragement, thousands and thousands of messages, electronic billboards, floral arrangements, ribbons on lapels, on businesses, on automobiles, a flood of cards, all have truly blessed Stillwater and this campus. We stand grateful for the prayers and kindnesses from around the world. Many universities have shown their support for OSU, even those against whom we compete most fiercely have worn our colors and bowed their heads with us. And we are deeply and profoundly touched let me share with you family members on behalf of thousands of believers here and a multitude that are watching god is faithful and he will not abandon you or your loved ones in a time of need and the fact that he has taken them home does not say he has abandoned them it has only provided an opportunity for him to confirm his love for them. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39 provide an incredible conclusion which we affirm to you today. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. May you find comfort from the prophet Isaiah from chapter 37. Devout men are taken away and no one understands but the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest in death. O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray that in the sunshine's glow its day may brighter fairer be. Someone in one of the university offices wrote on an electronic billboard yesterday, I wonder where our friends are now. Please don't think I'm trying to make these moments trivial, but perhaps a metaphor can speak to us. I don't know if they play hoops in that city four square. But if they do, Nate and Dan started yesterday. Hancock carried press releases to every end of the Golden Streets. There were some friends in the stands where they always were watching. Durfee coordinated the broadcast. A young staff sat confidently on the bench, and St. Peter must have been impressed that these young coaches surely knew more defense than most. And Brian, as always, scribbled an inspirational message on the chalkboard 
but this time with a newly found sense of awareness. When the one great scorer comes to write against your name, it isn't that you won or lost, but how you played the game. If you want to know how those God has called home are feeling today, just listen very closely. It's Tegan's. And like he always said, it's up. It's good. Thank you, Dr. Birdwell. You know, I had the fortune of knowing two of the guys whose lives we celebrate today, but the misfortune of not knowing all ten. I'm going to call on one of my colleagues to come up and join me in just a moment because the families and friends of all ten have shared some thoughts. And the ones I know and what I read about the others indicate to me they would have said it is plenty okay to laugh at some of these things and to smile today, and they would have wanted that. So we're going to share some of these uh, remembrances with you, and I, I think they're so sweet. Kendall Durfee grew up in a family-owned radio station where he and his brother Nelson worked for their dad. Kendall often told about driving down the road with his dad, and when most parents would have told their kids to hold it down, Kendall's dad would tell them in radio terms to knock it down a couple of dBs. That sums up who Kendall was. He was that guy that made the broadcast happen, whether it was on the road working ball games or in the ETS master control, making sure long distance education programs here at the school were transmitted without fail. Many faculty have commented that they appreciated Kendall's support and his infectious smile that went all the way to his eyes. Kendall enjoyed immensely his additional duties of producing radio programs for OSU athletics and his close friendship with Bill Teagans and Tom Dorado, and I know he loved you guys. Kendall loved his family, his friends, and his work. Kendall often told his co-workers that he would like to spend eternity in the mountains. In our hearts, that is where he is today. God bless Kendall's family. Several of Bjorn Falstrom's family wrote various thoughts about their times with him and were all unified into the same thought. Bjorn took full advantage of the life he had been given. It is hard to express exactly what Bjorn Falstrom meant to so many. All who knew him would agree that if his name meant one thing, it would mean full of life. He accomplished more living in his short 30 years than most will in a full lifetime. Bjorn's life included many things. Pro tennis, a career on the last great sailing vessels with the Swedish Navy, a stint on a Swedish cruise line, and of course, his passion for flying. Over the last few days, it hasn't been hard to find a picture of Bjorn smiling. No one will ever have a memory of him without it. He was the only Swede you will ever meet that had an enduring Swedish Oki accent. I'd like to hear that. Our family wants to say goodbye to him as your families want to say goodbye to your loved ones. Bjorn, we have lost so much in such a single tragic accident. We have lost a friend, a brother, a son, and a lover. For those of us who knew and loved Bjorn, we try to fill it with memories of his smile, his humor, and his love. We try to take comfort that he graced our lives, if only for a brief period. But we were fortunate enough to say that we knew our lives were better for knowing him. We love and miss you, Bjorn, and no one will ever forget you. God bless all the families who share in this horrible tragedy. A joy to all he knew. Nate Fleming began his blessed life on September 11th, 1980. He was born in Oklahoma City to Zane and Ann, younger brother of Sarah and Drew. Nate's gifts were so much more than athletics, always seen with a smile on his face. His upbeat personality and positive attitude were infectious. Nate enjoyed life to the fullest, and day, a day never went by that he didn't have a positive impact on other lives. He was awarded the I'm Third Award at Kanakuk Christian Camp. That demonstrated his desire to put Christ first, others second, and himself third. 
He was a tireless participant in Edmund North Philanthropies. He was designated as a Bring a Light to Others representative, where he successfully raised thousands of dollars for ill and underprivileged children. Nate truly desired to compete at the college level in basketball and successfully walked onto the team here at OSU in order to play for the legendary Eddie Sutton. Many times, Coach Sutton commented that Nate's work ethic and desire went far beyond his God-given ability, contributing to the Cowboys' attainment to the Elite Eight in the 2000 NCAA tournament. Nate was also a member of the President's Leadership Council here at OSU and on the honor roll every semester of his OSU experience. He was active in the OSU Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He inspired us all with his desire to contribute in so many ways, whether on the courts, in the classroom, or in the community. Nate Fleming leaves a mark on many lives. Bless his family. Will and Karen Hancock had made a New Year's resolution to take more vacations and enjoy life more. But anyone who knew Will already knew that really that wasn't a new resolution at all because that was the way Will really lived his life. Will squeezed a great deal of living into his 31 years. Everyone loved being around Will because he had a joyful attitude whether he was at work or at play. One of his friends said, Will Hancock was the best person I knew. He wasn't perfect, but he was the best, the most real and the most whole person I've ever known. Another friend said, for such a smart guy, Will was really down to earth. Will was generous in sharing his joy, yes, with his friends and family, but also with his casual acquaintances and strangers. In fact, early Saturday evening in the lobby of the Boulder Marriott, he laughed and shared child-raising experiences with a couple he didn't even know. He loved Karen immensely. He loved Andy totally. He told a friend just last week, I managed to get Andy to stop fussing and give me a smile before I left work today, and she did. It was the greatest feeling. I never felt anything like it before. Isn't that the most wonderful thing in the world? Will found joy every day. If you ever want to honor Will Hancock, then learn from his example. Laugh often, love much, and get a child to smile. Daniel Lawson, Jr. There are so many wonderful things to say about Daniel, and there are so many things we want people to know and to remember about him. He was a good son, a good brother, and a good friend, a good teammate, and a good person. He loved the Lord, and he loved God's people. He had so much potential to go far in life, and he was always sure to recognize the many blessings God had given him over the years. Growing up in Detroit, he excelled in so many things, but notably basketball and cross country. His parents, Daniel Sr. and Phyllis, his brothers, Eric and Austin, his sisters, Karen and Shanika, miss him terribly. One of his favorite people and one of his closest friends was Desmond Mason, and they are grateful for his presence today. Most of you from OSU knew Brian Lewinster as a highly qualified sports trainer, a loyal and fun-loving friend or a helpful co-worker. Brian, however, was foremost a loving husband and devoted father. He and his wife, Carolyn, had a connection like no other couple. They knew each other's thoughts and they could practically finish each other's sentences. They enjoyed the same activities and could have had fun doing absolutely nothing together. He constantly assured her that she made a wonderful home for their family and that she was an excellent mother to their two children. He was affectionate and loving with everyone in his family. Brian, Carolyn, Alexis, and Garrett were a family team at home. Brian eagerly dressed Alexis and Garrett each morning and fed them breakfast, even though he rarely ate breakfast himself. After dinner, the television was turned off and Brian challenged Alexis to different card games or helped her learn words, shapes, and numbers or read favorite books to both Alexis and Garrett. At times, he was a kid again himself like the times he sped down the neighborhood hill in a wagon ride with Alexis. He had participated in parent-taught swimming lessons and had taught Alexis how to go tubing at the lake. He was starting to help teach Alexis and Garrett how to throw and catch a ball. When the time came for them to join sports teams, he was looking forward to being their coach, a nice one who would show them the joy of sports and, yes, the honor in competition. But most of all, he would have shown them how to be a loving husband and a nurturing parent, the example of his own life.
It is impossible to know how many lives Denver Mills touched through the years. What is possible to know is that those he touched are better for having known him. While most men measure their success on professional achievements, Denver measured himself as a human on how much he could help others. His generosity knew no boundaries. His love and devotion to his family was limitless. And his affection for those around him led Denver to give himself endlessly. Denver glowed with pride when he spoke of his family, who survives him. His devoted wife of 33 years, Lindell, daughter and son-in-law, Catherine and Chris Wilson, daughter, Deborah Mills, and his son, David, a senior at OSU, is following Denver into the field of accounting. Denver is also survived by brothers H.M. and Paul Mills, sister Dorothy Turner and June Gowans, all of Kentucky. In addition, numerous extended family members survive him. Today would have been Denver's 56th birthday. After high school, Denver joined the Air Force where he served with honor in the Vietnam War. While stationed at Okinawa, he met his wife, Lindell, whose father was an, an Army colonel there. And after marrying in June of 1967 and graduating from Eastern Kentucky University in 1970, the Mills moved to Oklahoma City to begin his career and be back in her hometown. Over the years, Denver became a successful CPA and was a partner in the respected firm of Morrell, Hall, and McIntosh. Those who came to Denver for his services spoke admiringly of his counsel. But Denver's real passion was flying. He died doing what he loved. He was much sought after as a pilot and recognized by the FAA and his peers as one of the best pilots in the state and in the entire country. He thoroughly enjoyed his time flying the basketball and golf teams of OSU over the last seven years. He loved the players, coaches, and staff, and he was honored to be a part of the OSU family. Pat Noyes was a loving son, brother, and friend. He never knew a stranger. His job, and more importantly, his life, was dedicated to serving others. He reveled behind the scenes in the successes of others. He led a life of positive influence. All those he touched, either through permanent relationships, a passing conversation, or a simple handshake, made a lasting impression. Pat was the epitome of cowboy basketball. He was dedicated, loyal, and energetic, and passionate. Passion is the emotion of both love and anger. And as we have all experienced, Pat possessed the right amount of both. He served the basketball team in so many capacities. In all areas, Pat was not looking for and did not want to receive recognition. He would not want our loss to be mourned, for he was truly doing what he always wanted to do. The old saying goes, the man who is happy never worked a day in his life, and that was Pat. If Pat were here and able to give a few words of comfort to each and every one of us, it is believed that Pat would tell us to continue to strive to win. Win on the court, win in love, and when in life. In some way, we can look back on this tragic incident and find solace that Pat did indeed give his life for the game he loved. I want to take just a moment to tell you there are people all around the arena here wearing purple armbands, and if you need to talk to someone, share your grief, that's what they're here for. They're counselors, and they would like to help. There once was an eight-year-old kid who liked to throw the baseball against the basement wall at his house. And the whole time, he'd play a pretend baseball game in his head. This kid was different, though, because he also did the play-by-play. -play. His father told me last night that he would have his grown-up buddies over to the house, and uh, they'd be talking sports, but eventually they'd all kind of drift over to where... 12-year-old Bill was because he knew more about sports than they did, and they all wanted to hear what he had to say. Even as a little kid, Bill Tiggins knew he wanted to be a sportscaster. Indeed, he was born for it. His dream was to someday announce Major League Baseball. He knew the game. He had the delivery and the style. And you guys, he loved OSU. He didn't want anyone to know it, but he told me many times he'd have done the games for free. <laughs> If you watch Bill on television, you know that actually some of Bill's best sports cast were his worst sports cast. Uh, it was those times when his sense of humor really shined through, and you could see Bill Tegans. And after he'd have one of those sports casts, and we'd be in the commercial break, he'd turn to us and say, "Next week it's 
Tucum Carey Junior High Basketball is on the air. Bill liked to help young sportscasters, too. He was proud of his interns. Chris Harrison was one who has gone on to bigger and better things out in Los Angeles. Jason Price, and most recently Amanda's friend from high school, Dan Ingham, just to name a few of the many kids he helped to get their starts and start in sportscasting. Sports was his passion, but his family was truly his first love. In recent years, when their daughter Amanda was off at college, Bill and Janice enjoyed traveling together and taking long walks. And it was neat to hear him talk about their time together because he talked like a, a couple of high school kids who were dating again. It was really something to see. Bill often talked about being a beach bum when he retired. I told him he needed to aim high, and I felt like he was. In fact, Janice said she knew that any day he was going to come home and tell her he'd quit his job and purchased a tiki hut for them to move into. So we know where he is right now. Amanda, his daughter, was the apple of his eye. Right before she'd come home from school on break, he'd come out to the set and say, my baby's coming home tomorrow. Then a couple of weeks later, he'd be kind of melancholy and say, well, I had to take her back to the airport today. But he loved their walks together when she was home. Bill's escape was his backyard and his swimming pool. I don't know if he ever actually swam in it. He used to love to sit by the pool in the morning and read the newspaper and drink his coffee, and he especially loved it when Janice would bring home a copy of the Tulsa World to him. But he got especially angry at Gary when it was too windy for him to read his paper out by the pool. Someone once asked Bill Teagans for his best advice, and he answered saying, pay attention to other people's feelings. And that's what Bill did, and that's why so many people loved him. Bill was a gentle, kind, and very considerate man, and so much fun to be around. And buddy, your laugh will tickle our hearts forever. For the second time this week, that's a tough act to follow. Second time I've said that. But he's always perpetually tanned. He, he never got in that pool. He always had a tan, even in January. I could never figure that out. The good life, I guess. There are so many ways to describe Jared Weiberg. In fact, there are pages of ways to describe and remember him. Let it suffice to say the following. He loved his Lord. He is a Christian. He always had a smile for you, and it was wonderful one at that. He was a great encourager, shaking hands, was beneath him. He always wanted a hug. He was a hard worker. He always carried a positive attitude. He adored coaching. He always had time to have a meaningful conversation with you. He cared about what was going on in your life. He remembered everything about you and your family. He was not afraid to let you into his life and wanted you in his life. He wanted to share his life with you. He was ever so genuine. He was never afraid to tell you he loved you. He was always willing to sacrifice himself to help others. He was modest. He loved cowboy basketball and first attended Coach Paul Hansen's cowboy camp at age seven. He was proud to be named a student assistant under Coach Eddie Sutton. He was proud of his family and loved his mom and dad, brothers Chad, Brett, and sister-in-law Christy. He was looking forward to seeing his first nephew and being an uncle. He was honest. He had a pure heart. He hated to lose at anything. He was very competitive. He could always see the good in people and brought out the best in everyone. He loved to laugh. He loved to tease you. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was intelligent, determined, dedicated, thoughtful, and handsome. He was a great roommate to his brother, Chad. He will be deeply missed and loved completely for the rest of our lives. Thank you, Greg. Gosh, I don't know, it seems like for the last six years this state has been dealt more than its share of tragedy. And you know, each time we look for someone to step forward and to lead us and encourage us. And each time Governor Keating has answered the call. Governor, we look to you again today. Earlier this month, this wonderful arena was rededicated 
by the students and the faculty and the fans of Oklahoma State University and by our fellow citizens of Oklahoma. At that dedication, we were reminded of its history. Gallagher, Iba Arena, and OSU have been home to more national champions than any other campus in America. Today, we add 10 more champions to that long and storied list. Two of them played the game. Five of them supported those players as members of the athletic department and broadcasting staffs. Two were returning them to their homes and one was a reporter who never missed a story until this last one. Today, our Oklahoma family offers our open arms and our prayers and our love to the families of these 10 champions. We cannot fathom or remove your grief, but we can remind you with lowered flags and with our collective tears that we shall miss them too. If there is consolation, it is that they died doing the things they loved for the university they called home. If there can be comfort, accept it from your Oklahoma neighbors who know all too well what it means to grieve together. We don't remember the score of the game they played on Saturday, and it really doesn't matter. Champions are champions, not because of wins and losses, but because of how they live. Our 10 new champions lived well. As they left us, they handed us a lesson. Our greatest tribute isn't flowers or hymns or lowered flags. It is in following their example of a life well lived, where victory is only one result of honorable effort. Years ago, one of the men for whom this arena is named was asked about the rewards of coaching. Henry Ibis' response was simple and eloquent. He didn't talk about wins and losses or trophies or medals. Friendship, he said, is the biggest reward you can get. I know that Coach Iba has 10 new friends today, 10 new Cowboy champions, who will always be remembered for who they were. May God bless them. May God bless those they left behind. And may God touch all of us with his loving grace. Saturday night when we were learning the news, we were looking for leadership then too, and we found it in Dr. James Halligan, who represented the university with compassion and comfort. Dr. Halligan. When Ann and I returned on Saturday evening from a social event, the phone started ringing. And initially, of course, we didn't have any information. And then we went immediately to the airport and then to the coaches' offices. And we tried our very best to comfort the players and then to ensure that the families were being contacted. Over the last few days, I have tried to talk with individual members of each of those families. I must share with you that that is the saddest thing I have ever done. But it also, it also impressed upon me in their comments how they said their son or daughter was doing what they wanted to do. Their son, their husband, was deeply passionate about this program, deeply passionate about this university. And when life is all over, to have done something that engaged your passion to me is a blessing. So we have assembled here today, and I hope the families can sense since Sunday when we got together and tried to get our feet under us. We have worked very hard to put this together for you. And it is because we care so much. We care so deeply. That is why this event is being staged. 
This is one of the greatest assemblies of caring people in the 110-year history of Oklahoma State University. We are trying to encircle you with our love, to show you that we care, to show you that these people made a big difference to us at OSU. I would like to do a simple thing today, and my staff always knows that I abbreviate my comments once I get to the microphone. I would like to ask you to join me in resolving that every time you enter this arena, henceforth, you shall think of these 10 men and what they did for Oklahoma State University. Let us resolve that we shall never forget them. Never forget them. That every time as we approach this building, we shall recall them and what they did for us. They were, for the most part, in the flush of life. And people have asked me, why does this happen? And I give them a simple answer. I don't know. I guess they were so special that God simply decided to call them home. He needed some good cowboys up there in heaven at his side. And certainly OSU produces the best cowboys. There's no question about that. And so that's why he called them home. To the widows who are here, I'd like to say to you simply, we want your children to attend OSU. There will be a place for them at OSU. We will, we will provide for their education. You may be assured of that. We want your children to come here and be a part of this family. It is important to us, terribly important to us. This, the world has changed for Oklahoma State University. It'll never be the same. You and your family are a part of us in a way that words cannot describe from this moment onward. And that is why, as Terry Don said at the beginning, we will, at an appropriate time, dedicate a memorial in this facility. Not only that, we have been in contact with a landowner in Colorado. Ann and I will shortly go to Colorado. We will make arrangements for a memorial at that site. We will invite you to be in attendance when we dedicate that memorial. You are a part of us. We are a part of you. We are trying to encircle you with our love so that you know we truly care. We have tried very hard to make this special for you because they were so special to us. I want to thank all of the dignitaries who have traveled such distance to be here. Governor Keating, Lieutenant Governor Fallon, thank you for being here. We have a whole host of representatives of Big 12 universities. We have presidents and chancellors, regents, trustees, all have come here today simply because they want to also show you that they care. This is all about the players and the families. This is what this event is all about. What we are trying to say to you, what we are trying to demonstrate to you is that OSU cares about you. May God hold you in the palm of his hand is an Irish expression that I dearly love and I sincerely believe that he has your loved one in the palm of his hand at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Halligan. And now more of God's gift of music to us. OSU's Vernon Black Gospel Choir under the direction of Asia Hogg.
terrific. Thank you, guys. Last night, OSU held a press conference. Coach Eddie Sutton was there, Frederick, and this young man who wants to come up and speak right now and say a few words. And we were all so impressed. Andre, if you'll come on up. We're all so impressed with his maturity and his eloquence, and I know he's been a help to his teammates. And uh, our prayers are, are with all of them today. Andre, come share your thoughts. Good evening. I don't know. First, I would like to apologize to the families for having to meet under such circumstances. I mean, it's tragic. And next, I would like to uh, express our thanks to the OSU community, Stillwater, everybody in the Big 12, everybody all over the world for it. I mean, they came out, showed support. I mean, family, friends, loved ones. Uh, I don't know. It's, I mean, I came up here, I'd been thinking since I've been asked to do this, what can I say to make it a little easier? I mean, I've experienced so much, and I mean, there's so many families here that would never expect something like this. And the one thing I looked at, I found a poem. I mean, I was at a funeral about a month ago. My cut, one of my closest family members died. And it was something that was on his obituary that, I mean, it really touched me, and I'm gonna share it with everybody. The title of it is, I Am Free. Don't grieve for me, but now I'm free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. I found that peace at the close of the day. If my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss, Oh yes, these things I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full, I've savored much. Good friends, good times, and a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief, but lengthen it, don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me, now he has set me free. And I mean, to the families, this isn't really goodbye, because I'm a strong believer in God, and I know all of us, I mean, we have to go down that road to death, and if we believe, we'll know that this isn't goodbye, I mean, we'll see him in the morning. Thank you. As an OSU fan, I'm thrilled that Eddie Sutton is our basketball coach. Uh, I love what he does on the court, but you know, seeing him last night especially. I appreciate him even more as a Christian man and the leader of this basketball team and these young men. And uh, my prayers have been with him and his family and all of you guys during this time. Coach Sutton, come up and share your thoughts with us if you would. Thank you. Saturday night's tragedy took the lives of 10 people who were precious, not only to their families, but to each one of us that are here. In dealing with death, nothing seems more unfair, more confusing, more senseless, more jolting than when the light goes out far too soon on bright young lives, but it did happen Saturday night. We gather this afternoon to celebrate the lives of Dan, Nate, Pat, Brian, Jared, Will, Bill, Kendall, Denver, and Bjorn. These were our teammates, our coworkers, our friends, but more than that, they were part of the Cowboy basketball family. Family goes far beyond, or family goes beyond the bounds of fatherhood and brotherhood. 
Look around this arena today and you see a family joined by a common desire to share pain and comfort to each other and to the families of our fallen friends. While our hearts have been broken because of their loss, we remember today the good times. A better way to honor the dead than with grief is with gratitude. And I am grateful that I knew, worked with, and grew to love these 10 wonderful people. They were all stars in their own way. When I think of Bjorn, and I didn't know him as well as the others, I, I got to know a, a man that all of a sudden got caught up in cowboy basketball enthusiasm. And he used to, uh, Denver told me this, he said, you know, every time Bjorn has a free moment, he wants to fly with me to take the team somewhere. And I think he and Frederick used to speak in Swedish and nobody knew what they were talking about. <laughs> and Denver, he was the most dedicated and safest pilot that I ever flew with. He loved to fly the Cowboys, and he was always there to help with their luggage. And most of the time when we would come home, he was the only one that put food on his plane, so the players liked to fly back with him. And I remember, you know, in the Big 12, we only get 25 good seats when we're on the road, and they're behind the bench. And I can still see Denver down in Austin earlier this year and last Saturday in Boulder standing up and cheering for his Cowboys. Kendall, I'll always remember him for all the good times on Monday evening when Tom Dorado and I would travel to the different fraternities and sororities here on our campus to do my weekly calling show. He was a pro. There were never any hitches when we had our program. Will, he was the most efficient sports information director he would do anything for my coaches any time of the day. I told Karen the other evening, and I've been at three other great institutions and had some wonderful people in the sports information off department, but Will was the best. Brian, he hadn't been with us long, but we grew to love him. He was the most caring trainer that I've ever had. And I remember he did it in a way that, he, like with Terrence, he was pushing Terrence, we gotta get you back. Gotta get you back on that court. And at times I know Terrence didn't like to hear that, but he did it in a way that Terrence accepted it and just a tremendous man. And I think of Will and Brian, they were both University of Kansas graduates. And I used to tease them about those Jayhawks, but believe me, they still rooted for Kansas but I know where their loyalty was. It was the OSU Cowboys. I want both their wives to know and their families that our players dearly loved Will and Brian. Bill, he was the most humble sportscaster that I've ever known. No ego, but he was the most competent that you'll ever find. You know, a lot of times in the media there's some jealousies but I've never known one of the people in this state that are sportscasters or sports writers that didn't like Bill Teagans. I think the thing I'll always remember, because we could joke around and, and we had such great times that 10 years we did the games together, but I always knew with Bill there was always a big smile. When we lose a game, and it's always hard to accept defeat, but I always knew that Bill would have a smile and something kind to say to me and to my staff and, and to my players. Dan, he too had a big smile. And uh, I think of all the wonderful student athletes that I've had the opportunity to coach, I've never seen a player that was so drawn his teammates to him. He's like a magnet. Uh, you know, they always want to be around, around Dan. Yeah, I found out earlier today why 
because he had so many lady friends, and uh, <laughs> these guys were trying to latch on to one of them, I guess. And who'll ever forget earlier this year when we played the Cyclones and he made those three great hustle plays late in the game when he, we missed a couple of free throws and he rebounded them and then he took a charge late in the game to, to salvage the victory. Nate, he was the perfect student athlete. Uh, I've never heard anything bad about Nate. His sisters even called him Goody. He loved OSU, and he loved Oklahoma State basketball and our team. You know, a lot of times walk-ons aren't treated just like your scholarship players, but every one of these young men that represent our school who play on our team, they loved Nate, and they treated him just like he was on scholarship. I know for sure all of our students that are here, he was the most popular player on our team. And I can still see Nate down there on that bench, down on his hands and knees, cheering and say, you guys, get some more points. Give me a ticket so I can go in the game. <laughs> Jared, eager, bright, a shining star, helpful, nice. Coach Keller was telling me today that he remembers last year when we were getting ready to play the University of Missouri that he and Jared stayed down there till about four o'clock in the morning splicing the, the scouting film together. The thing that I, I guess I will miss for sure is watching Jared and Pat grow into great coaches. They would have been outstanding basketball coaches. They were really students of the game. Pat, I don't believe I've ever seen a more competitive person. He's the only person my staff at all the great schools I've coached at, whether it be a coach, a student assistant, a student manager, that ever got a technical foul for me. <laughs> and I can still see him when he was a student manager and he was down here with uh, Jimmy and, and uh, all those managers. Uh, used to break down the goals. You know that most managers aren't as tall as basketball players, but they still have the great love of the game, and some of them are pretty good. And Pat was a great athlete. But they'd break the goals down to eight feet so they could dunk. <laughs> Pat spent more hours than I ever spent or any of the coaches. He was a tireless worker, and... Uh, I know for sure that, uh, and I guess I'll tell this, because when I called his mother and father the other night, it really touched me, and uh, where they would decide to bury Pat. And they said, Coach, Pat loves OSU and the Cowboys and you all so much that we've made a decision to bury him in Stillwater, Oklahoma. We will honor their memories by dedicating ourselves to being the best we can be as students, as athletes, as family members, as coaches. This is what our team has made that commitment, and I would ask each of you to do the same. In a book, when your friend is grieving, grief always picks up a person in one place and puts a person down in another place. Let our grief today and our celebration of our lost friends put us down in this place. That realizing that we are also fragile and realizing each moment of life for each of us in this arena is precious and fleeting we vow not only to let go and let God take care of it, but also to find ways to live every day to our fullest, loving best. It will be difficult and now seemingly impossible, but we will get through this. 
and we will be better people for it. To the families of these 10 men, please know how much I love them, and please know how everyone will continue to pray for you. And also know that you will always be a part of the OSU basketball family. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate you. And I want to encourage everyone just to reflect on the lives of these uh, 10 great guys while the concert, concert chorale performs for us again. Dr. Ward.
Thank you. Uh, before we go, I've been asked to share a letter that uh, was received by Dr. Halligan. Dear Jim, on behalf of the entire University of Colorado at Boulder campus, and in particular the CU men's, women's basketball teams, I want to express our sincere and heartfelt sympathy to the 10 families who have lost their loved ones, their friends and teammates, and to the entire campus of Oklahoma State University and the community of Stillwater. This is a tragic time of deep sadness, and it reminds all of us that family, friends, and human relationships are the most important values in our lives. As you spend time in remembrance of these fine people whose lives were lost on Saturday night, please know that we are with you in spirit, thinking of you and sharing in the tragic sense of loss. And during this week, we are flying the Oklahoma State flag at half-staff on the CU Boulder campus. Sincerely, Richard Biney, the Chancellor, Colorado.